Um, so today's class, we're going to get into costing and the handout that you picked up on your way in has some of the costing tables that we're going to be using. So uh, they look a little bit intimidating right now. We are going to break them down and see how to use them um, and show you that they can apply very generally. We looked in uh, Monday's class actually at two parts to the costing formula. So I'll just quickly review those again. So we had looked at, in fact, the looking up the database cost, and I said we would, we would simply get this from some database, whether this is your company's internal records or whether this is from an outside source. And for example, the papers that you have would be one of those external sources, and these <laughs> sorts of tables come from a textbook by Dr. Woods, who was a professor here at Mac. I've mentioned his name a few times. So he compiled a lot of these tables and actually the software like Aspen and some of the other software out there that does cost estimation builds on these sorts of public tables that he made available. So we really should get comfortable with how to use these public database sources. But my point is here, you really can get this anywhere and there's a variety of quality of information out there. Once you get that database information at a specific point in time, and usually it's 1970 or some reference point in time, we then pick out a, an inflation factor that adjusts for capacity. So we spent the last class looking at that. And then once you've adjusted for capacity, we adjust, adjust for the fact that uh, we need to bring this cost up to the current day. So we adjust for inflation. So let's look at those two pieces again. The capacity factor we said last time always has this sort of form where if you're designing a new system, we'll use the subscript A for your new, new process, and B refers to your database or your known instance. So you know your database cost and you know what size that unit was. So that factor there refers to some specific parameter of the unit that correlates with cost. And we, we went through a discussion of what that might be last class. So for example, heat exchanger, the factor that correlates with cost is surface area of the heat exchanger. Um, for distillation columns, that factor is the height of the distillation column multiplied by the diameter raised to the 1.5. Uh, for pumps, that factor would be related to the power of the pump and so forth. So you look up the factor and it's given to you in these database tables and you know what your design is. So we always know factor A. Okay? You're designing a process, you need a heat exchanger that's got a certain area, you've calculated that from the equations and tools that you've learned in your heat, heat transfer course, for example, or you pick up that from Aspen or from HiSIS. So you also know factor A for your new process. So you know three out of the four terms there, um, sorry, you know four out of the five terms there. There's also n, the exponent n, which is also given to you um, typically. And if you don't know n, you can assume a value of 6 over 10 or 0.6. But typically we'll get a, a far better estimate of n over there. So now you know four out of the five pieces of information, you can go ahead and calculate the cost um, adjusted for capacity. Then, uh, so we did an example of that last time and I showed you where this information comes from. So Dr. Woods then, all these graphical tools that he's gone and done, um, he's gone and summarized in tabular form over here. After you've adjusted for capacity, we also need to adjust for inflation. And uh, that was what these indexes were about. So I introduced four indexes last time and I said to you we would be focusing mainly on the chemical engineering plant cost index. And in fact, in this tutorial coming this week, you'll look a bit more on your own how that index is derived. And I showed you the time-based trends of those indexes and we did an example last time. So the key, the key point that I wanted you to take from that um, derivation last class is that these were multipliers. So let's just go back here. <clears throat> you take your database cost, you either increase the database cost or decrease the database cost, depending if this number is greater than one or smaller than one. 
Um, if you're designing a unit that's larger than your database unit, that factor will be above one. And inflation is almost always over one because you're going to a newer point in time further down. Okay, so we'll look, we'll come to the installation factor in today's class. That's a, going to be a part of our focus as well as adjusting for operating conditions. So what I'm going to do at this point is uh, not use the projector too much. I'll come back to it. But, um, well, maybe let me just finish up this slide with the one that you have in front of you. So if you take the handout and you turn to the side of the page, there's two, page, two sides, um, but turn to the side that looks closest to this one, where you see a diagrams of various heat exchangers on the top. <clears throat> So let's, uh, let's learn how to use this for estimating the cost of heat exchangers. The first thing that we have to look up is verify that we've got the correct heat exchanger. So if we're designing a shell and tube heat exchanger, we would, it, this uh, Dr. Woods has it set up so that he shows you various configurations. And then reading down here, we see we've got a shell and tube heat exchanger, and these are the conditions for which the database refers to. It refers to a design that's at roughly atmospheric, 1140 KPA, C-S, carbon steel, bare tubes, delivered costs, tubes of 4.85 meters length with either 2.5 or 1.9 um, centimeter outer diameter tubes. Okay, so that's our base situation, our database. And what we read off here is that a heat exchanger of 1 times 10 to the 2, so one, one multiple of 10 to the 2, so in other words 100 meters squared, would have cost 8, and there's a little bit of an exponent there, times 10 to the 3. So we, what we read there is that a 100 meters squared heat exchanger would cost us $8,000, is the interpretation of that. Well, when is that for? It is for a point in time. It's certainly not in today's money. That would be extremely cheap for a heat exchanger today. It is for, if you notice there, there's MS equals 300. That refers to Marshall-Swift index being 300. So the Marshall and Swift index was approximately 300 at the start of 1970. Okay, so that's how we know the point in time for when that correlation was. So top top right hand side MS equals 300 indicates that that's 1970s costing information. Okay. So in your course project that's coming up later on, you'll be costing about 10, 15 different units and you'll be looking at a number of different tables and getting the costs for each of the units that make up your flow sheet. So right now we're just looking at a heat exchanger. Then we would go look at a pump. Then we would go look at a distillation column and then a fired heater. And we add up all these various costs. So just focusing on the heat exchanger, we're currently just seeing the historical price in 1970s is $8,000. Is $8, when we use these tables, we also need to check that it's valid for the situation we want it for. Okay, so if we want to design a heat exchanger that's larger or smaller, well, how much larger can we go? How much smaller can we go before this correlation breaks down? There's a range over which we can use it. And this range is a little bit tricky to interpret. So I've given you a way to do it that will, will always work. The way is to write out the lower bound and the upper bound. So we've got, it's valid between 0 0.02 and 20. So write it out as your lower bound and write it as your upper bound. And in between there, put the following. Factor B, factor remember refers to the feature of the unit that corresponds with cost. In this case, it's heat transfer area. And B, the subscript, refers to the unit that um, we, we're wanting to design. So the area of the heat exchanger we would like to design over the reference heat exchanger. The reference heat exchanger here is 100 meters squared, so 10 to the 2. Okay. 
And so if we bring this 100 denominator out to both the left and the right hand side, we resolve that inequality to be that our heat exchanger, as long as it lies between 2 meters squared and 2,000 meters squared, this correlation is valid. Okay, so that's what that, we've essentially interpreted the first four columns over there. The next column is N, and that's your exponent if you want to adjust for capacity. So in this case, it's telling you for these heat exchangers, the assumption of 6 tenths, or 0.6, isn't quite accurate. Heat exchangers actually have a slope on the curve we looked at on Monday that's closer to 0.71. So rather use an exponent of 0.71 would be a better adjusting factor for capacity. And then the final value that we're of in, of interested in right now is our error. It says that whatever cost we calculate from this database is going to have errors of plus or minus 40%. So, I'm not sure about the range varies from 0 0.4 to 20. Yep. I'm having 40% error range, which is close to accurate range. But then you have to work objectively. Yep, this is. And Remember what we said this is for. This is not for a detailed design of your process, right? This is simply for screening and for getting a rough estimate of whether you should go ahead with this project or not. So 40% errors are fairly acceptable at that point. Once you've made a firmer decision, then you can go seek uh, firmer quotes. But there's no point in trying to get a firm quote and then decide you're not going to go ahead with the project because to get the, the, the cost just to get your quotes is long, right? So we want to be able to just screen alternatives here and get rough numbers. So 40% error is fairly acceptable. Okay, so what I'm going to uh, let you do is uh, try to use this table then and, and cal calculate an estimate for a shell and tube heat exchanger. So here it shows you what that looks like. There's the outer shell, there's the inner tube bundle. Um, you've seen these sorts of images before. This is from a company here in Stony Creek that we've, um, or myself and students prior um, here at Mac have visited. Um, and that would be a typical configuration of a shell and tube heat exchanger. So what we're going to look at is getting an estimate of the cost of such a heat exchanger that's 70 meters squared and made from carbon steel. Okay, so give that, uh, Give that a try over there for a, for a second or two. Like, just see how you might go ahead and estimate the cost in 2000. And then I'll show you a more formal process to work through it. So what you want to do is essentially apply this formula over here. Is look up the historical cost in 1970, adjust for capacity, and adjust for inflation.
Okay, so the first check that you would have done and, and seen quite easily is, as I said before, this, this correlation is valid between 2 and 2,000 meters squared. So our, cor our situation of 70 meters squared certainly falls in, in that range. So we can go ahead and use that correlation quite easily. And what we will then just say is the database cost And I'm going to just introduce this notation that will help us is the FOB cost in 1970. Okay. And I'm going to put subscript A to indicate that this is for our new for our desired or design heat exchanger that we want to plan for. Oh sorry, not this is our um, this is B, sorry. Our database, our reference cost is $8,000. So that's the historical value that we look up. So the first step is to adjust for capacity. So this is a heat exchanger that's for 100 meters squared. Our situation is for 70 meters squared. So we know we're going to get a value that's lower than this. We want a smaller heat exchanger, so we should get a, a smaller dollar figure. 100 meters squared. So if we're adjusting for capacity, one way to write that and avoid confusion is to say the FOB cost in 1970 for one heat exchanger ratioed over the other heat exchanger still in 1970 dollars, is equal to factor A over factor B to the N. So if we then calculate the FOB cost in 1970 for our desired case, it's going to be $8,000. And then let's ratio the existing unit is 100 meters squared. And our desired unit is 200 meters squared. And the exponent we should use is 0.71 from that correlation. Oh, I'm sorry. I got them the wrong way around. Uh, so 70 is our desired case. So A is our desired case, and B is the existing or the database cost. So I'll just add the units in here to emphasize that they cancel out. <coughs> okay, so if we calculate that cost then, we get a value of <coughs> $6,210. So we're still in 1970 and I'll just keep emphasizing that here. Okay, so the next step that you might want to go ahead and do is to inflate up for inflation, to bring it into um, newer, newer time. I think the question asked to estimate the cost in 2000. But what we should do is, and I'm going to explain this, uh, there's, there's several steps, but what we will do is postpone the inflation right till the end. We'll essentially work everything in 1970 dollars calculate a single answer and then just bring that single number up to 2000 values. So there, is, there are some other costs though associated with the heat exchanger. This is simple, simply the cost of the heat exchanger FOB. Remember FOB was 
for the heat exchanger on someone's loading dock. It doesn't mean the cost of it installed and, and getting it um, going at our site. So what that looks like, I'll just bring up that picture again because it helps illustrate what FOB does and where we get the estimate from, is recall that we have to consider bringing all the piping around this device into place. And the number that helps us do that is this installation factor. So we actually will apply the installation factor first and then do the inflation step last. The installation factor is read off the table in the following location. There's a column there called BM right here near the end and it's 3.14. BM refers to the bare module costs. And it's a simple multiplier. So let's, let's use that. So what we say is, we'll call it our factor BM So we, we mentioned where we get that value from. And we apply it as follows. We say dollar bear module in 1970 for unit A is the FOB cost in 1970 for the unit times FBM. So it's a simple multiplier. And in this instance, it says take $6210, multiplied by 3.14, and we get a value then of 19,500. Okay. So my bare module costs then are 19,500. So that's all of the piping and everything. It's a little bit more subtle because we're taking this cost of the heat exchanger, multiplying it by the multiplier, and essentially this cost here gives you the dollar figure of the unit plus all the material and piping and painting and foundations and hookups and connections and sensors within a three meter radius. So let's emphasize that then. If you wanted to, sorry? Yeah, that's what the, the 3.14 is. Just everything in the, in the radius around the units to get it operational. So if we want to be uh, specific here, we can break out it as installation costs is in fact equal to 19,500 minus the cost of the unit, and then you'll get a number of 13,290. Okay, so the unit is 6,200. Getting it installed and all that piping and hookups and so forth is 13,000. And the sum of those two is 19,500. Okay, so, so far, our costs in 1970 for everything in the bare module on is around $20,000. There's no more extra cost to consider. We can now bring that number up to today's dollars. Okay, so let's, let's do that then. So, we can always write it as follows, inflation factor in 2000, we're going to use the year 2000 here as our reference, sorry, as our target year. Our reference year where we started from is uh, 1970.
And that ratio corresponds also to the ratio of the bare module cost in 1970 for this unit divided by the bare module cost in 2000 for this unit. So we're after that denominator term over here. This is what we want to know. We have the other three values. We can go look up the inflation factors for the two respective years. We've just calculated the bare module cost in 1970. So let's bring it up to today's dollars. Okay, there was a question last class about why this is, doesn't have an exponent n to it. Well, it, it doesn't have an exponent n to it because it's a pure ratio. It says that if we ratio the indexes between two different years, it's the ratios of the costs in two different years. Remember the index is calculated in, is, a, is just a, an arbitrary number that tells us how things become more and less expensive over time. And so we just take the plain ratio of the numbers. There's no scaling for capacity over here, so there's no power n. So solving that equation, BM2000 for A, and we can look up the, the numbers. They are So that's the ratio of the two inflation factors, 1,089 over 300 multiplied by 19,500. And we get a final cost in 2000 of 70,500. This is the inflation factor from 1970 uh, over 2000. Okay, so I, maybe I'll just re rewrite this bracket there symbolically is IF 2000. Does that make sense? A bit more sense. Okay, so Marshall and Swift in 1970 was, had a value of 300. Marshall and Swift in 2000 had a value of 1089. You could have used the CEPCI in, uh, factors as well, and you would get a number that's roughly the same, but a little bit different. You're not going to be far off. You're certainly going to be within the plus or minus 40%. Okay, and then there's one final step that we have to perform, and that is we don't report that number directly. We report it with the error bounds. So the last step is to say the expected cost is somewhere between 42,300 and about 98,700. So that's minus 40% and plus 40% costs. We're going to look at that um, coming up in a minute, yeah. <clears throat> okay, everyone clear on, on the steps followed here? You're going to have lots of practice in the tutorials doing this. And this is a fairly straightforward one. There's a few examples coming up that are uh, start to add and um, vary on this basic process. So let's at least make sure we've got a good understanding of this system. Okay, so no questions just yet? Okay, now 
There was a question just a minute ago here about pressure. So let's just uh, bring up the slide. And I want to point out that um, we had done this case for one megapascal. One megapascal is close to this base case of 1140 kPa. So it's about a thousand, a thousand pascal, sorry, a thousand kilopascals is one MPa. So what we notice here is that if we go to higher pressures, we want to operate these heat exchanges at different conditions at higher pressure, we have numbers here that so show multipliers of 1.15, 1.25, 1.45, all the way up to 5.1. So these are modifiers that increase the price of the unit for higher pressure. We have modifiers as well if we want to change the alloy that the unit is made from. So right now the base unit is made from carbon steel, but should we choose to make um, them from <coughs> copper, brass, or some of these other alloys listed there, um, or that's the tubes only, or if we wish to make the tubes and the shell from a different alloy, we have multipliers that are fairly substantial. Okay, so for example, the, the most aggressive multiplier there is a titanium multiplier of 13. So these now add substantial costs on top of the base unit, but not in an obvious way. Your expectation might be to simply take the cost of the unit that we've just calculated and just add another multiplier onto it. But there is a bit of a subtlety and that's what we're going to look at next. Okay. So let's investigate that. I'm going to modify this problem by asking you to consider a heat exchanger that's made from stainless steel and that needs to operate at a pressure of 5.6. So what I'll do there is just add these numbers on the board. I'm going to take the slide away so I can use the full board space. Okay, so I'd like to operate at a pressure where that multiplier is 1.52. If you look at the table, a 1.52 multiplier corresponds to operating at a pressure of 5.6 MPa. So if my design pressure is at that point, I need to look up the closest multiplier or do a small linear interpolation if I'm not exactly at one of those pressures you can linearly interpret, interpolate the multipliers. So the multiplier here for pressure is 1.52. The multiplier for material, I'd like to make the shell and the tubes from, stainless, uh, from 316 stainless steel. So the multiplier there is 3.0. Okay, so that's, everyone see where that, that comes from in the table. <clears throat> So let's go see how we adjust our, our procedure for that. Okay, so let's go back to our, our prior calculations. Our prior calculation said we look up, so I'm referring to that very top board that's over there. We look up our database cost for $8,000. So everyone's with me on that one. $8,000 is the cost of my heat exchanger made from carbon steel. If I adjust it for capacity, so in other words, this is for a 100 meters squared heat exchanger, but I'd like it for 70 meters squared. We came to this calculation on this board over here. Go. I may have, okay, you raised it here. We adjusted it for capacity by ratioing it and raising it to the exponent 0.71, and we got a cost then of 6210. Okay, so 
So that's where that 6210 came from. So this ratioing for capacity doesn't matter whether it's made from stainless steel or carbon steel. So the pressure that we're operating the unit at or the material that it's made from does not affect the capacity ratioing. So we still do that as we've normally done. <coughs> then when we were doing the problem earlier, once we got this 6210 number, we went across here and we multiplied it by the bare module factor, 3.14 to get the cost of not only the unit of the heat exchanger, but all of the piping and materials around it. And we got this number of 19,500. And we said that if we broke that number apart into two pieces, we got the cost of the unit itself, the 6210, and 19,500. Now notice here that 19,500 again, does not depend whether the unit is made from carbon steel or stainless steel or any other material. It also does not matter and will not affect the installation price. This 13,000 will not be affected if it's operating at a different pressure. So up to that point as well in the problem, you make no adjustment. You still do it exactly like we did before. But what we need to go realize is one other thing. That I want you to think of that bare module factor and that heat exchanger sitting in the middle of it. If you've got your heat exchanger sitting in that bare module and you've now decided to upgrade your heat exchanger from carbon steel to stainless steel, do you need to upgrade anything in your bare module as well? Do you need to change the foundation? Do you need to change the painting, the uncrating, the sensors, the temperature sensors, the pressure sensors? Okay. Okay. So if you've changed, the, uh, as was mentioned there, if you're changing the materials, so from carbon steel to stainless steel, you will have to likely go change the piping inside the bare module as well to prevent corrosion. Right? Your reason for changing from carbon steel heat exchanger to stainless steel heat exchanger might be because you're dealing with food grade products. So you don't want contamination there or corrosion occurring. But you wouldn't go hook up a stainless steel heat exchanger to carbon steel pipes. Right? That defeats the whole objective of the heat exchanger's upgrade, potentially. Right? So what we have to recognize is that multiplying by this 3.14 over here, will, there's something else to it that we need to take into account. It is not just the upgrade of the material and for pressure that we need to take into account. There's pieces inside that bare module that will also have to be upgraded. Okay, so we should consider that and that's what we're going to look at next. So this is where, where um, it might take a little while to get used to it, but I'm going to explain it as follows. So Inside this bare module over here is a, about a three meter by three meter by three meter box. And we have our heat exchanger sitting. And if we're upgrading that from carbon steel to stainless steel, the foundations likely don't need to be changed, but these internal pipes and some of the ancillary equipment inside the heat exchanger will need to be upgraded. Now, to understand which portions inside the bare module factor need to be upgraded, we need to understand a bit more about where that 3.14 number comes from. So this isn't just a number that uh, Dr. Woods arrives at. There is a bit of a breakdown to it. And let's, let's take a look at that next. So I'm going to go back to the slides <coughs> and show you where that is.
Okay, so this is um, a little bit further down in your notes. So pay, slide 136. And let's take a look at it as follows. <clears throat> now this number here, we're looking at heat exchanges, and the number from this table is, is not 3.14, but it's pretty close. It's 3.37. Okay, so um, just to, I would like you just to ignore that slight disagreement. And as far as these things go, that's a very minor difference in numbers. But I would like you to see that this number that we use, that bare module factor, is a component it was made up of a number of components. The first is, of course, the unit itself. The unit has weight equal to 1. And the way we interpret this is, let's say that that's my heat exchanger cost. Let's say that's $100. It means that for every $100 of heat exchanger I'm putting in, I also have to put in $46 of piping. That's what the 0.46 is. For every $100 of heat exchanger that gets installed, I also have to put in $5 of concrete for support structures. I also have to put in $3 of steel, um, $10 of instruments, $2 of electrical, $5 of insulation and, and paint. Okay. And I add up that to that point. Then there's a cost here for installation, <clears throat> for freight, insurance, and taxes engineering, overheads, and you add all of these up and you get a number of 337 or 3.37. <clears throat> so let's, <clears throat> let's break that down a little bit. It says your final bill to get that heat exchanger put into place, connected, all the engineering work, painting, insulation, electrical instruments, and so forth is going to be $337. Of that, $100 was for the base heat exchanger itself. 46 for the piping, and so on, and it adds up to 337. Okay. So that bare module factor has inside it a portion due to piping. So here's where that idea comes for the material and the pressure upgrade. If we're going to upgrade the heat exchanger with a different material and for different pressure, not only do we have to uh, pay more for that heat exchanger, but we're also going to have to adjust for that piping factor over there and upgrade the cost of the piping inside the bare module. Okay. So let's see how that gets done. <clears throat> So essentially what I want to do is, not only do I want to up update that price, I want to get the extra cost for, for the piping and the, and the hookup inside that bare module. Right, everything else is, remains unaffected by the upgrade in the piping, uh, sorry, the upgrade in the material. So for example, the concrete foundations, the instruments, the electrical, those things will cost the same no matter what the heat exchange is made from, no matter what pressure and temperature it's operating at. So let's take a look at um, where we left off there. We said the heat exchanger costs $6,210 back in 1970. So dollar FOB So how much extra is it going to cost to upgrade that heat exchanger from this basic price, which was for carbon steel and for one MPA? I'd like to update the price now to be for stainless steel and for 5.2 5 MPA. And what we saw there is we have to multiply that by the pressure factor and the materials factor. So let's just uh, sub in those numbers there. 6210, the pressure factor was 
and the materials factor was 3.0. And what that says is our cost for that revised heat exchanger now is equal to 28300. Okay, so this is the cost for a heat exchanger that's made from stainless steel and can operate at a pressure of 5.6 MPA. Now notice here what we did, oh, let's go back to this example that we looked at here earlier. We took the FOB price and we multiplied it by the bare module factor of 3.14 and I got a price of 19,500. But if I subtract out the original cost of the heat exchanger, I'm basically getting the cost of installation, 13,290. Let's go apply that same idea here to the piping and materials upgrade. And we're going to essentially see how much it costs to upgrade our heat exchanger from the base case to the newer case. Well, that's just the difference between the two numbers. So the upgrade cost is equal to 28300 minus 6210. And the difference between those is 22110. So that's the incremental cost to upgrade the heat exchanger. Now, let's just to, just to end off here, I'm going to summarize what we've done. And in, in the next class, I'll look a little bit more at that piping factor again. So just a quick summary is so far we've got three costs. Our base heat exchanger. cost 6210. The cost to install it cost 13,290. And the upgrade cost was this number we've just calculated. 22,110. And there's one final cost we're going to look at then in on Friday's class, and that's the cost to upgrade piping inside the bare module. Okay. So there's one other dollar figure that we'll look at in on Friday's class too. To estimate. Okay, so this upgrade cost, I'll just emphasize this is for pressure and materials. Okay, so we'll resume on that on Friday's class.